All right, unit 7.2 is going to continue to look at nuclear chemistry. And for what we're going to look at now, we're going to look at the concept of binding energy. So the first thing we need to understand is what's called a unified atomic mass unit, which is U. And basically what they did is they took a carbon-12 atom and they said, well, let's divide that into uh, 12 equal pieces. So one twelfth of a carbon-12 atom is one U or one unified atomic mass unit. That value is going to equal 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27th kilogram. Now, what we have to understand is that a proton, there are six protons and six neutrons in carbon 12. So whenever we write carbon 12, right, we're going to write carbon dash 12. 12 is going to be my atomic mass. We know carbon has six protons. That would be its atomic number, right? If we were to write carbon, it would look something like this, six and 12 in terms of my mass and my number. So we know it has six protons, six neutrons by its mass adding up of protons and neutrons. Now, what we have to look at then is the mass of a proton, an electron, and a neutron in terms of atomic mass units. For an electron, it's incredibly small. 0.000549 U's. A mass of a proton is 1.007276 U's. And then of a mass of a neutron is slightly larger than the mass of a proton, 0.008665 U's. And we do need all these sig figs, right? So for the most part, we can't just round to three sig figs. We're going to need all of these as we're working through this because these small values here are going to make a big difference. And that big difference is going to come when we talk about something called mass defect. Mass defect is going to be the difference in the masses of a nucleus and the nucleons which are in it, which we should understand that nucleons are simply going to be protons and neutrons. Uh, and what we see is that the mass of a proton and a neutron, if we add up all of those individual masses, it's actually going to be larger than the mass of the nucleus itself. If we take a look at carbon-12 again, carbon-12 has a mass of 11.999, 99958. <clears throat> However, if we take a look at its protons and neutrons, right, it has six protons and it has six neutrons. And again, the mass of a proton is 1.007276. And the mass of a neutron is 1.008665. Now, we can understand if we were to combine this six times and this six times, we would have a value of those added together, which is going to be greater than 12. So if we look then, there is a difference in the mass of carbon-12, which is 11.99 and the sum of its individual parts, which is actually greater than 12. That is considered the mass defect. Another example of this is if we look at copper 63, <clears throat> which copper 63 is going to have an atomic mass of 62.91366. Now, if we take a look, copper has 29 protons. And so those masses combined are going to be 29 point, or let me show us how we do that. That's going to be 29 times 1.007276, which is going to equal 29.211004. If we take then the 34 neutrons, what it also has, that's going to be 34 times the atomic mass unit of a neutron, which that's going to equal 34.29461. And when we combine them, then their total mass of those two is going to be 63.505614. So there's a difference between the mass of the nucleus itself and the mass of the individual pieces. And again, that is called the mass defect. And we can find that mass defect by simply doing the difference in those two. So the mass defect or the difference in mass 
is simply going to be 63.5056.14 minus 62.91367. So you can see why we need all those sig figs. And that then is going to give us a value of 0.591944U. So that's our difference in mass for copper. Again, this is atomic mass units. So, and remember, one atomic mass unit is an incredibly small amount of kilograms. So that value could also be, in terms of kilograms, 9.8321 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms. So we're talking about a very small amount of mass difference, but there is a difference. Now we need to know that difference because that difference is going to help us understand the concept of binding energy. And that the fact that there, because the nucleus, right, is made up of all these protons, and what do the protons want to do? They want to repel each other. They want to push each other apart. And the neutrons kind of act as glue, kind of helping hold the nucleus together. <clears throat> But it's using some amount of energy, and that energy is found in the difference in masses of the individual pieces, as well as uh, the mass of the um, nucleus itself. So that is considered the binding energy, the energy required to break the nucleus apart, or the energy required to basically hold the nucleus together, can be found as the energy to break apart is equal to the mass defect times C squared, or as you guys really the most famous equation, E equals MC squared. So we can find the energy of that copper, right? So if we talked about copper 63, we said the difference in mass is going to be equal to uh, 0 0.591944 atomic mass units or 9.8321 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms. If we plug that in then, the energy equals 9.8321 times 10 to the negative 28 times the speed of light squared, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th, that value squared. That's going to give me the energy of 8.84. 10 to the negative 11 joules. So that's how much energy is required to hold together one copper 63 atom based on the mass defect between the difference of the nucleus mass and the mass of the individual nucleons. If we look at this graph then, this is showing us the binding energy of the elements that we find on the periodic table. So down here we have the number of nucleons in the nucleus. So as we move over, we're going to different elements, and this is the average binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts. So what we see is hydrogen 1 has zero binding energy, and remember, binding energy is the nucleus. We're not talking about electrons here, we're talking about the nucleus. Hydrogen 1 has one proton, so there's no binding energy. Hydrogen 2 has a proton and one neutron, so it has some binding energy. Hydrogen 3, helium 3, right? But what we see is as we're adding protons and neutrons, our binding energy is increasing until we get to a point of about nickel 62, where now we start to see that binding energy is becoming less and less and less. So what that means is in here, it's going to be hard to break apart that nucleus, right? Whereas here, it's, we're going to need less energy to break apart that nucleus. And we're going to relate that then to the idea that these elements to the left of this peak of our binding energy actually have a, a more higher probability of going through fusion, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And then this side typically would go through fission. And those are the two main processes that we're going to go through when we're talking about nuclear reactions and the splitting or the combining of the nucleus. So what's the difference between fusion and fission? Fission is going to be the process, and I think of this as like when, when a soda fizzes, 
right? That's the releasing of carbon dioxide. So it's separating things. So fission is the large, it's a large nucleus breaking into a smaller nucleus. And this is usually what happens within nuclear reactors. So an example would be uranium-235 is going to split into smaller elements, xenon and scrontium. <clears throat> and what we're going to have is our mass units and our atomic numbers are going to add up on either side as well. So this uranium is going to split into two smaller elements, as well as release additional neutrons. And what we're going to see is that the mass that starts on this side is going to be greater than the mass that starts on that is left on this side. So our mass, our conservation of mass really is in terms of the numbers is the same, but the actual mass, right? The atomic mass is greater here than it is here. And what that's going to do then is if we found the mass defect from these values and these values, right? We could then find the energy that this nucleus splitting apart into two of these would release using E equals MC squared. On the opposite side, so, so fission typically happens in large elements, the large atoms that split into smaller. Fusion is when we fuse things together. That's when we're going to take small nucleus and we're going to combine it into larger. And this is actually what's happening within our sun. So if we have hydrogen one, hydrogen two, and we combine those, we push them together, we're then going to create helium three, our atomic mass is conserved, our atomic number is conserved. However, the mass of my individual pieces here is greater than the mass of my final product here. And again, that's going to produce a mass defect. And then that is going to be able to figure out how much energy is released in fusion using E equals MC squared. Fusion is a much superior form of energy production than fission. However, it is incredibly hard to produce, uh, and fission is much easier for us to split apart an atom than it is to combine those nuclei into a new atom.